From years of anxiety to warrior and mentor, Bradley Robinson created the Anxiety Project to help you end your anxiety naturally. Let's mold the new you and let's end anxiety together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Anxiety Project Podcast. This is episode 197. Man, almost at 200. I can't even believe it. Today, I'm answering your questions, some amazing ones, talking about the self-doubt that creeps into our minds, especially when you think you're progressing. You've overcame a fear or you thought you did and the voice comes in and says what if you still have it what if you're not the person you think you are what if what if and that makes you go oh no it startles you you know you start to pay attention to it how do you overcome that voice then I go into how do you quit sugar right a big one how do you quit sugar now it's interesting about addictions because some people can quit sugar easily and then not quit smoking easily right that becomes their ginormous mountain some people can quit smoking and then other people can't quit shopping on amazon so everyone is different which is so interesting and i want to get into addiction i want to get into but more specifically sugar and my process out of sugar but also i want to give you guys resources to overcome sugar because I know so many people are struggling with that. I'm sure you are and I, or at one point you did. Then I want to get into the famous and powerful books that will help ease anxiety. So I want to go over those and well these are the big books that impacted me and I find to be extremely useful when I suggest to people and they read them, they go, "Oh my god, this book is life-changing." So I want to give you guys those books. And then I want to get into night anxiety. How do you overcome night anxiety? Why do you experience night anxiety? And uh, what I do and what I did to tackle that night anxiety. Because that was something huge in my life. And so let's start off with that self-doubt. That voice that comes up and goes, well, maybe you still have it, that illness. You thought you overcame it and bam, something comes up or something new pops up. What is happening? Well, first I want to say that that voice, well, there could be some novelty revolving around that voice or the sensation that you're ruminating over. There's still that uncertainty. Now, this question comes from M. Manish. Hi, Brad. Can you talk about how to overcome the doubt of it? And I'm and I think you you mean sensation. Can you talk about how to overcome the doubt of it? Sensation might being an illness. I have kind of overcame the fear, but still my mind likes to doubt. It still likes to doubt yes and manish now you can challenge that voice with the rational voice this more evolved part of our brain the prefrontal cortex it has two hemispheres it has the right and the left the left well the whole the whole hemisphere i would say is involved with problem solving right the right hemisphere produces a lot of the unknown images, the amalgamation of the what-ifs, the imaginations you partake in that spiral you into anxiety. So you imagine the worst-case scenarios, you imagine the illness you have, you imagine, uh, you know, fainting, throwing up on the subway or the bus. And then you have this left hemisphere, The left hemisphere is more of the rational voice, the voice that is involved with problem solving, but also can be the voice that says, oh no, what if, what if, what if, as you know. And so we can engage in a new voice 
by using this part of the brain. We can say, okay, well, I am healthy because I do these things. We sometimes forget how badass we really are how much we've overcame. And then we start to self-doubt. We start to hit walls. We start to listen to this eight-year-old whiny voice creeping in the back of our minds without any real challenge. So it's really important to challenge this voice and say, well, so what if I have that illness? And then keep saying that until the tension you have, the feeling you have over this voice subsides. So give it a real challenge. Oh, so what if I have this illness? Well, if I have this illness, then this will happen. Okay, so what if that happens? Well, then I'll have to do this. Okay, so what? And then you keep saying it like a mantra, you'll start to feel the tension build, but then you'll also notice that it releases eventually. Because you're not giving in to the thought and playing with it and dancing with it rather than you're letting it go. You're challenging it. You're not letting it in all the way into your unconscious mind by reacting to it with high emotion because when you react to it with high emotion, you know, it stores within your unconscious mind because in your unconscious mind, that's where your values lie, right? The, what you pay attention to the most determines what you value. So you pay attention to the thought the most, you're going to, it's going to, the significance of it will be, well, throbbing. (laughs) It'll be so powerful, emotional to you. Next time it pops up, you're going to react to it. Oh my God, there it is again. And then that reaction is just only going to cement in the significance of it. But until you start to challenge it, Well, it's going to stay at the forefront of your mind. So start to challenge it, Manish. It's really important. Now, in your question, you also said, I have kind of overcame the fear. Now, kind of. That doesn't sound like you conquered it yet. And I would say that you should continue to push in that direction and challenge the fear. Now, I don't know specifically the details of the fear you're overcoming and what you've done so far, the practices to get you where you are, but it seems to be working for you. I want to say that you need to challenge yourself more. Because you can fall back into old patterns. A lot of successful people and the the mentors I follow, they have their daily disciplines. They wake up, they'll have a routine, they'll have a ritual, they will have their sacrifices throughout the day. They won't, you know, hang around negative friends. They'll sacrifice weed, alcohol, short-term pleasures for long-term gains, right? That's how they see it. They understand that life is about continual growth. And I'm sure, Manish, you see this within yourself, getting to where you are now, that by sacrificing certain things in your life, things have gotten a lot better for you. And so successful people, your mentors, I hope, they do those rituals every day. They understand that if they set themselves up in the morning, they do their exercises, they meditate, they take their cold showers, they journal, whatever it is, they know that they're going to have better success throughout the day because of the momentum they set for themselves early on. It's really important because you are who you act out, right? Who, how are you acting? Are you getting up and at 10 and then you're eating Fruit Loops and then you're not making your bed? Things are messy around you. And well, pay attention to those things. But look at your routines. Look at the lifestyle you're currently living in. And then, and then 
improve on those things around you. So adjusting your diet even more will help maybe, right? So always looking at your strategies, Manish. Look at your strategies. What are you doing that could be improved, right? Maybe you're, you've are you gone on a diet, but then you could even go further on the diet. Maybe you can even subtract some stuff. Maybe you need to subtract someone else who's negative from your life. Maybe you need to subtract some of that Netflix time and do something more productive. Sometimes you can fall backwards and then the doubt and that, that nagging self-talk will heighten itself. And it does for me. If I'm not doing my rituals and routines, that voice starts to come in and say, hey, Brad, you're not doing as much as you could. Oh, Brad, you know, you're feeling, you're feeling like this. Um, maybe you know, you're not doing enough. Maybe you need to stop watching Netflix because you're feeling like this. And maybe you need to go for a walk. Maybe you need to meditate. Maybe you need to write this down. Write the stress down. And so, yes, it's about being aware over yourself, being aware of the thoughts and then challenging them. Yes, that's one thing. But also maybe there's things you could do more of during the day that you're not quite there yet. Maybe you need to desensitize yourself over this fear by going back to the place that's making you feel anxious. Where does the sensation show up? Does it show up at, up at nighttime? Does it show up when you go to the mall? Does it show up at the movie theater? Wherever it is, go back to the environment and then and make new associations over the symptom itself, the sensation. And th- that means you have to stay in the environment until your anxiety level lessens and lessens until eventually you become bored of it. Because you have an emotional reaction towards the symptom, sensation. How do you become bored of the sensation? How do you lessen your emotional attachment? By making new associations. That's the question. How do you make new associations? By showing the sensation that it's not a threat. You can do that by changing your lifestyle choices around so you could you could add more healthy routines to build on this healthy foundation so that when you look in the mirror and you say man you know i feel great because of what i'm doing every day because i just exercise i feel so good of course i'm not uh, i'm healthy of course i'm healthy and so the sensation will start to lessen its intensity also Going to the doctors that one time, I like, I don't agree that you should go like 10, 15 times, right? That's, that's a problem. I remember I had this strange bump on the inside of my lip that was causing me a lot of emotional distress. And I was like, why isn't it going away? I had this lump there for months, months, it won't go away. It's irritating me. It's making me angry. And then I go to the doctor. The doctor says, oh, Brad, I'm, that's just, you know, that's nothing. And she was like, just uh, all you have to do is just leave it alone. And if it doesn't go away in this amount of time, come back and then I'll give you some stuff for it. Then it'll go away. You know, it's nothing to worry about. And that gave me so much relief that I left the doctors. I was like, oh, my God. Huh. My, I had noticed that my emotional response over the, that lump completely went from an eight to a one. And then I woke up the next day, didn't even think about it. And then two days later, the lump was gone. The lump was gone after months of it being there. Months. I thought it was like six months I had it. More than that. It was like one of those bubbles, like uh, those cysts on uh, on the inside of your lip. And it just caused me a lot of anxiety. I was like, or just frustration even. But I noticed that because of my doctor's response, it made me change my emotional intensity over it. And I felt great. I felt great. 
And I noticed that there was a connection there. I made a new association over it. So make a new association over it. You can do that on your own by the different habits and routines, but also even visiting your doctor and getting an exam, getting it examined and getting a firm answer. Yeah, it helps. Unbelievably, it unbelievably helps. And so to conclude, Manish, this has been a long answer to your question, and I hope that you guys uh, appreciate that. But I'd like to conclude with this. I would like to know your strategies, Manish. The strategies you've implemented so far. Because I would suggest to you that you continue to do them. Because they're working. It seems like they're working. Keep doing them. And remember that those strong people, the people, the person I am now, I am this way because I tend to my garden. If I stop tending to my garden, my mind, the weeds will start to grow and it'll just be too much in there. Remember, anxiety disorder is order that is disrupted. The next question comes from Almost Zen. What books do you suggest or read that helps with anxiety? I like reading ancient stories and texts like Musashi or Seneca as they are relaxing books set in different eras back when life moved slower. Absolutely. Thanks for doing the Q&A. Well, thank you, Almost Zen, for sending in that question. I love this. And have you read Marcus Aurelius's uh, Meditations? Because that is such a great book. That's one of my recommendations, by the way. But another one I would like to start off with is Rewire Your Anxious Brain by Carl and Pittman. This book is unbelievable. It's like neuroscience in layman's terms. The book lays out the amygdala in detail, gives examples of what the functions of the amygdala are, and then the cortical brain, why you can think and imagine your way into panic attacks and anxiety. So the book lays out these two pathways. It's so amazing. The book talks about the functions of the amygdala, how we store emotions, how it's our emotional brain, why it makes associations, they give great examples of the associations. And then they talk about the other pathway where you can imagine certain scenarios that lead to anxiety and you can use the internal dialogue you have to produce anxiety like I talked about briefly earlier with uh, Manish's question. So then they go into how you can use these pathways to lessen your anxiety. Really, really powerful. The next book I want to recommend is Mindset by Carol Dweck. I've mentioned this book many times on the show, but the book lays out the two mindsets, the set mindset, the stuck mindset, and oh, you can also say the victim mindset, the qualities of that mindset and why that is not the ideal mindset to live life and to improve the quality of your life. And then she goes on to talk about the developing mindset and why this mindset improves the quality of your life, why you need constant growth and you need to consistently learn and grow and develop yourself all throughout life. And that's what enriches you and also improves the different areas of your life because you have to kill off the certain parts of you that aren't working, right? You have a whole system of programs within you and some are not providing you with the results you're looking for. You have to bring those programs into the light and you have to say, okay, I don't want this program anymore. What can I do to change this? And that's part of the development in life, the developing mindset. The next book I want to recommend is A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. Love this book. 
because he talks about the ego. He talks about the dissolving of the ego. And this was the first book that really opened my eyes to the present moment. Because I remember sitting on the train one day reading this book and I was looking out over the water and the book was so powerful that it brought me into the present moment. I looked up from the book and I was just in this stillness that I never experienced before in my life. And it brought a lot of awareness into me and I hope it brings that awareness into you. The next book I want to recommend is The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. This is so powerful. It talks about trauma, trauma, how we store trauma and the different ways we can release trauma. Really powerful. Thank you for that question. Malika sends a sends me a question saying, please, Brad, give us some tips for quitting sugar for good. I gave up smoking, then drinking, but this one seems almost impossible. It's funny, Malika, you know, there's some people that can quit sugar easily and then they can't quit smoking. Each person is different, right? For me, porn was the big one for me, but then I have to say sugar was pretty close after that. I stuck to sugar like glue. And how I tackled sugar was I had to justify to myself why I should quit. Because perhaps there isn't enough justification to why you should quit right now. The more pain you attach to sugar, the more you will move away from sugar. As you already know from overcoming smoking and alcohol, right? Why did you quit smoking? Why? What were the reasons behind it? Maybe there's not enough justification because sugar, yeah, it can cause Diabetes, right, raises your blood sugar, cavities, cancer feeds off sugar, sugar causes a lot of autoimmune issues like allergies and leaky gut and oh my god, the list goes on and on. Reduces your stomach pH, uh, causes a lot of indigestion, a lot of stuff. Also brain fog. And so it's important that you communicate with yourself to why you want to quit what would what would it be like do you want the clear mind that sugar that a sugarless lifestyle provides do you want to feel healthy lighter do you want to feel uh refreshed waking up in the mornings do you want to avoid the crashes sugar provides I follow a really great doctor who I recommend to you, Dr. Ken Berry on YouTube, who helped me transition into a ketogenic diet. A ketogenic diet is high fat, high protein, and low carb diet. Low carb is the key here. Now, sugar, lots of carbs, right? You should just avoid it, sugar. Sugar is one of the things that you... Get rid of completely on this diet. Sugar, grains, and a lot of, man, vegetable oils, getting rid of vegetable oils, and keeping your carbs 50 grams or lower. And that that includes net carbs like found in vegetables and fruits and berries. So I used keto substitutes to transition from the standard diet I was on to this one. And what I mean by that is I started to feel the withdrawal symptoms of quitting sugar and carbs, right? You crash, right? You go through carb withdrawal. Some people call it keto flu. It's pretty much carb withdrawal. And it makes you want to go back to the sugar because you want to start to feel normal again, right? Because you got to go through that pain part, 
before you get to the other side. That's why I'm very strict on a ketogenic diet. I don't cheat because I don't want to go back there and have to go through the withdrawal again. It's real. And so a ketogenic diet includes mostly meat, fish, eggs, uh, some dairy, maybe some vegetables, some berries. But for me, I quit a lot of that and I'm mostly eating meat-based, meat-heavy chicken, eggs, pork, uh, mostly beef, lamb. And this is what makes me feel the best mentally. Now, I want to get back to the keto substitutes. I was taking a lot of keto cookies, keto cakes, pies, pizza crusts, because they're not as bad as the floured version or the sugar versions. So that was good, but they're not but you don't feel that the greatest eating those keto desserts. But it's a great transition. So I, for for you Malika, I recommend that you start to transition yourself into keto desserts because they taste great. They're filled with sugar uh, they're filled with sweeteners instead of sugar. So it you'll feel a difference. You'll taste a difference, but the, actually they taste a lot better, in my opinion, than regular desserts, right? I think so, because they're very rich and they're full of whole foods rather than, you know, a lot of the crap in, in the stuff that you get in the candy aisles at Walmart, right? So I want you to transition to keto desserts, but then I want you to eventually transition out of the keto desserts and just eat real whole foods because eating real whole foods is satiating. Fills you up, keeps you full for a long period of time, and the energy that you get from that is huge. The mental clarity is huge, and you'll see within your body a lot of those physical illnesses or the aches and pains that you used to have, they start to go away. You start to notice an improvement over your health. And so so have that dialogue with yourself. Why do you want to quit sugar? And uh, what are the results are you, that you want? What are those results? Make it clear. Follow Dr. Ken Berry and have a mentor. Use him as a mentor to pursue this diet journey. It changed my life. I am sure it'll change yours. I also recommend the book, The Dietitian's Dilemma by Michelle Hearn. I talked to Michelle on this podcast before, and she's amazing. She is amazing. Her book is crammed full of why... The current dietary system is faulty, why sugar and carbs are unhealthy, and how to transition into a ketogenic way of eating. Now, her podcast is number 178, so I highly recommend you go and listen to that once or twice. Thank you for the question. Simone says, how have you tackled night anxiety. Night anxiety for me was a result of the amount of unresolved problems revolving around me at the time. I overcame night anxiety. Now, if there is a lot of unresolved traumas, those traumas will present themselves at night. The doors to your unconscious mind, I like to say, swing open when you fall into sleep because the unconscious mind likes to play itself out through dreams while we're asleep. And if there's a lot of trauma, fears, it'll haunt you. They will come out of the closet. They will present itself. A lot of people with anxiety have a hard time sleeping. A lot of unresolved past memories. So 
the first thing is, yes, you have to work on those unresolved memories. You have to work on the traumas. You have to release them. You have to do releasing trauma exercises. You have to learn about trauma and how they can be released. The next thing I want to say is you want to set yourself up for success. So an hour before bed, I want you to relax. I want you to well, try to relax by taking a hot bath, by reading, by listening to calming music. For me, I would meditate and light some incense. I would plan my day. So I'd write down on a piece of paper what time I'm waking up, what do I have to do, what time do I have to be at work, what time do I have to eat lunch or do this or do that. I wrote it all down so my mind could not, could settle. Then I would put on calming music or sound, so like waves or trees rustling or rain or rivers, and I would play that as I'm sitting there, or laying down, sorry. And then I would also play podcasts from my mentors who talk about anxiety, who talk about trauma, because I found their voice soothing. They were my comfort. I used them as I was obsessed. I became obsessed about overcoming anxiety. And that was part of my obsession. I would play their podcasts while I was going to bed because I was just completely fueled to overcome this hell I was in. And that helped me go to sleep or tackle my night anxiety. And then I recommend that you have a consistent sleep and wake time. So yet that you're circadian rhythm starts to regulate itself so if you don't get a proper night's sleep i still want you to get up at the same time maybe you can take a nap in the afternoon i'm not against that but i want you to keep your sleep and your wake time the same it's really important even if you don't feel like getting up you get up anyways And at night, when you wake up with anxiety, don't turn on the TV. Do not go on your phone, go on YouTube, go on social media. I just want you to sit with yourself. I want you to just sit there. Maybe read a book. Maybe take that hot bath. Just maybe walk around. Maybe make yourself a tea. But I want you to reduce the masking and coping strategies and sit there sit with the pain sit with the sit with the suffering do things that calm you down do things that you enjoy and also for me i had a lot of fear of not getting enough sleep that would fuel my anxiety And then I started to say, you know what? If I stay up all night, so be it. And that's where I'm going to leave you on this podcast episode. Thank you, everybody, for being here with me today. And thank you for the questions. I am so grateful for them. I hope that they have enriched your life and provided you with a lot of strategies and tools for you to reach your higher self. You can rise above anxiety. Remember that what you do during the day determines the quality of your sleep at night. Think about that. If you are coping during the day, you're not healing. It's when you start to change patterns, you change your behaviors, you start to confront those underlying traumas of your past, things start to change. Learn from those people who have healed and follow them. Start to implement their techniques. Do not let anxiety define who you are. 
I will see you on the next podcast episode. Bye for now. Brad's Powerful Anxiety Recovery Program is now available at unpluganxiety.com. The Anxiety Project Program is downloadable and puts the power of anxiety recovery in your own hands. Visit unpluganxiety.com for more details. Recovery starts now.